and welcome. Thank you, likewise. And we have our uh, RNAO president as well, Morgan Popharth is here. Do you wanna say something more again? Hello, thank you so much for joining us and to uh, take the time out of your, what I'm sure is a schedule that's equally as busy as ours to talk about uh, issues that impact nursing and issues that impact Ontarians. So thank you so much for joining us during nursing week. Our, ple our pleasure, Morgan. And I'm really happy to have uh, uh, Peter Tabbins and I think Rima Burns McGowan uh, when she arrives with us this afternoon as well. And uh, I, I don't know if we're going to uh, continue to wait for Doris, but maybe I'll just I'll just use my minute or two uh, to um, while we're waiting to 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 just say thank you. Um, I know it's been a rough go for a very long time, uh, and I know that it's pretty much uh, nurses that have been well. I mean, it's been nurses that have been holding uh, Ontario's healthcare system together, our hospitals together, our community services together. I mean, you've been doing all the heavy lifting and. Uh, I, I just, the gratitude is immense and I wanna just express that uh, absolutely. So I'm, I'm pleased to be here. If any of you know me, I, I'd much rather be doing this in person. <laughs> I, like, I can't believe I'm, I'm saying this, uh, but I, I miss my touring and my ability to spend uh, my days uh, when I'm not in the legislature, visiting all kinds of uh, different uh, uh, parts of, uh, of Ontario, but all, and all kinds of different workplaces. So uh, it's, it's really, really important. Um, to be here with you, in my opinion, uh, and I, I didn't want to pass up the chance to do so, and I, I'm sure Peter and Rima feel the same. We, we really do respect uh, and appreciate uh, not only everything you bring to our healthcare system, but all of the other things that you could be bringing <laughs> to our healthcare system as well. Uh, but uh, thanks very, very much for, you know, for really being there for this past year and uh, more than a year, actually. It's been it's been pretty tough, and I, I think we we need to acknowledge that. So, thank you very much, Andrea. And I was oh, listening to you from the beginning. Uh, thank you for spending the time with my colleagues, with our colleagues, and us. Uh, you will hear a bit from our OHD. This is the East Toronto OHD, actually around my corner, around the corner of my house. I cannot. I can tell my colleagues that at the same time that I feel. Uh, we all do. So very proud uh, of the work that this specific BPSOHD is doing. I dread every time I hear the ambulance. It's like if it was in my home, exactly, because it's walking distance. It breaks my heart to think who is in that ambulance. It breaks my heart to think who is receiving that patient, who is the family left at home crying, uh, who of my colleagues nurses are um, yet again, uh, going to the, to the hardship of being both a nurse with the, with the expertise and the knowledge and also uh, the nurse with the heart for being also kind of a quasi family because the family cannot be there. It just breaks my heart and, um, and it didn't need to be this way. It, didn't, it did not need to be this way. It should not have been this way. Uh, and yet you are there. Um, with that, I, I want to make just a couple of comments and then pass it on to our colleagues. And uh, it's very apropos that you are there and we are listening to the press release we just issued. And that's why I was a touch delayed talking with the media. They were asking me how come nurses wrap up nursing week with a press release that has in their view, nothing to do with nursing. <laughs> and I said, well, it actually, the press release has everything to do with nursing because nursing is about first, keeping people healthy and second, patching them up, as Tommy Douglas used to say, when uh, the society or the health system in this case breaks down, in this case, both the society and the, the health system. And what we requested in this press release is um, a living wage, basically, not the $15. So Andrea, I hope to see in your platform, not the $15, but what we are asking. Uh, and what we are asking also is the 10 days uh, sick time for absolutely anybody that doesn't have it on permanent basis. Because I think that politicians as a whole, both in this country 
and in the world. And I was just talking with my staff today about that. Uh, and healthcare leaders or so-called leaders in the system do not understand what's coming on to them. There will be a revolution, and I mean it. I mean it. It's a revolution and a long, a long overdue revolution on those people that today you have in ICUs that will come out of the ICUs hopefully alive, and if not, their families, and they will be demanding different and better, and it's about time. It's about time. And the second revolution that you will see, and it's not led by RNO, but it will have all the oxygen in the world that RNO can give, is a nursing revolution. Um, the new generation of nurses are not, and I'm talking the ones working and the ones coming are not going to accept it anymore the way it is. And on that, you will have a surprise next week and it will be major. Uh, it got to stop, guys. It needs to be different. And it's not because it's the NDP or the Greens or the Liberal or I don't care which party. It's because people deserve better. Enough is enough of what's going on. And not just with this government, <clears throat> previous governments in BC, in here, everywhere. It needs to change. Uh, you cannot keep people down for, for longer. If not, look what's happening in the Middle East. You cannot keep people down with their heads because for good people say enough is enough. So with that, I'm giving it to uh, our BPSOHT uh, that I say I am proud because they really have worked different. So BPSOHT, Sandra, are the OHTs that you have heard about, but when they are BPSOs, they work with our guidelines and with our program. But this particular uh, BPSO, OHT has worked just admirable, admirable with vulnerable populations, admirable with people that work, that live in homelessness or people that uh, have addictions or people from all walks of life that are people like you and me and anybody else. So I pass the baton to you, Marjorie, and to all the colleagues and you have our utmost respect. Thank you. Yeah, I see Mar yeah, I see Marjorie uh, giving me the floor. Thank you, Doris. Um, so good afternoon, everyone. I think I have the pleasure of being your MC and I'm gonna try and keep it pretty tight. Um, I'm gonna introduce myself, but before I start, it's my pleasure to welcome you. Wish everyone a happy mm -hmm. nursing week on behalf of East Toronto Health Partners. A very warm welcome to our guests, leader of the official opposition, Andrea Horvath, MPP Rima Burns-McGowan, who has joined us, which is great, and MPP Peter Tobbins, as well as, of course, Doris, your team at RNAO. And there's lots of folks here on the call from the East Toronto Health Partners, or ETHP, as we are fond of calling ourselves. It's really nice to be uh, participating in this Take Your MPP to Work virtual event. So we are so pleased to have the opportunity to highlight the very important work that our nurses are doing in our community to care for patients um, during COVID. I'd like to thank all of the nurses across the ETHP partnership who are attending to patients in hospitals, providing vaccines in the community, helping people stay safely at home and so much more. We know the pandemic has made this very challenging. Doris eloquently spoke to that. We're so appreciative for all of their exceptional work. So my name is Catherine Nickel, and I have the privilege of holding the position of President and CEO of VHA Home Healthcare. But more importantly, this week, I am a nurse myself, and I currently hold the position of Chief Nursing Executive um, at VHA. So I have a couple of hats wearing there, but proudly this week, I'm wearing my nursing hat. VHA is a not-for-profit charitable organization that offers 24-7 health care and support services in the home across many regions of Ontario and has been an RNAO best practice spotlight organization for many years. We are a proud member of ETHP and it's my pleasure to sit at the leadership table. Personally, like you Doris and others, I know I live in East Toronto for have done for over 25 years um, so this work is near and dear to my heart in so many ways. So we, my job is to give you a little bit of background about ETHP and the, the ways we have, uh, have been able to advance and improve care by working together as an Ontario health team. 
So ETHP is a group of more than 50 community, primary care, home care, hospital, and social services organizations in East Toronto working together to improve the way our community accesses and receives care. It also includes the East Toronto Family Practice Network as well as clients, family members and caregivers who are also here uh, with us today on this, uh, on this call. We work together to provide care and support to the 250,000 people who live in East Toronto, as well as the additional 75,000 people who choose to receive their care here. And our catchment areas includes neighborhoods such as Thorncliffe Park, Flemington Park, Taylor Massey, and Oak Ridge. And in 2019, a short two years ago, uh, we collaborated with RNAO to become one of the first best practice spotlight Ontario health teams. So we have so much to be proud of. Uh, you know, the OHT work is, uh, has been fairly recent, but this group of partners have been working together for more than 25 years in many ways. So during the COVID pandemic, we've collaborated, of course, even more deeply to protect the health and safety of our communities. And the flexibility and coordination that is possible because of our Ontario Health Team relationships have really made our work successful. And our nurses have been at the forefront of some of the unique initiatives that we're going to share with you today. I'm going to provide a, a very brief overview of, of the four initiatives, and we do have nurses involved in all of these initiatives here who will be answering uh, questions, and if, if you have questions, they'll be answering your questions as well. So I just, uh, I see Marjorie has put the slide up, which is great. So to increase hospital capacity during the pandemic, Michael Guerin Hospital and my organization, VHA Home Healthcare, have partnered to create a safe space to transition medically stable patients away from the hospital to allow hospital beds to be uh, dedicated to those with the most pressing acute care needs. This site uh, is housed at the atrium at Q Beach Retirement Home. It's considered a Michael Guerin Hospital unit run by VHA and the staff working there are largely VHA nurses and personal support workers who work collaboratively, co collaboratively with Michael Guerin Hospital staff and physicians. And then the past year, the, uh, the unit has expanded from 22 beds to 46 beds, so more than doubled in size and is now housed on two floors. And the collaboration has led to improved patient outcomes with the addition of physio, and smooth transitions to different settings, including us uh, having folks uh, uh, move home and also to supportive housing. So that's the first. The second is the COVID-19 Extender Nurses Program. This program was developed to support those who need to self-isolate uh, due to COVID, but are challenged to do so given the impact of social determinants of health. Registered nurses check in with clients every two to three days as needed for symptom management, community referrals, informal counseling and advice. And many of these clients do not have access to primary care. So this collaboration between the hospital and community agencies is crucial uh, for providing support for these clients to help stop the spread of COVID. The opioid crisis is one of Ontario's most, most deadly public health crises and these deaths we know are preventable. Safe consumption sites and su uh, safe supply programs are critical for helping to manage this. And additives in street drug drugs are creating a toxic drug supply. And this along with pandemic isolation are the leading factors contributing to fatal overdoses. So as part of our opioid response, Nurse practitioners in East Toronto's Safe Supply Program are working to increase access to prescription opioids, to find alternatives to unregulated drug supplies, and registered nurses in our consumption treatment services are part of an interdisciplinary team that provides wraparound support for clients. And East Toronto Health Partners is committed to improving care for adults with substance use and health needs as one of our priority populations in the initial work together as an Ontario health team. So the last area is in, in today's session, we wanted to recognize the important contributions from nurse practitioners and nurses in system design and in the formation of the East Toronto Family Practice Network, otherwise known as East FPN. We have several nurse leaders joining us today who have stepped up to assume some really important leadership roles. So this is a, just a very brief snapshot of the way some of our nurses working together across partner organizations are making a huge difference to the people of East Toronto. 
So for, for more detail and to hear from the, the, the people themselves, I'm gonna pass it along now to uh, Mickey Layton, who is the Interim Chief Nursing Executive at Michael Guerin Hospital, who will moderate our uh, nursing panel. Over to you, Mickey. Thank you, Catherine. Uh, Doris, thank you for hi highlighting how hard our nurses are working. Um, they are the backbone of the healthcare system and they are exhausted. I thank everyone also in the chat for expressing their gratitude to nurses, especially during nursing week. Um, I have the pleasure of um, speaking with some tremendous nurse leaders in the community, part of our OHT. Um, I'm at minimum very honored just to be asking these questions of them. Um, the first is, question is for Bernadette Letner. Bernadette is an RN with the South Riverdale Community Health Center. And Bernadette, who is out in the field, I believe, working, can you reflect on your time as COVID extender nurse? What were some of the biggest challenges that your clients faced and how did you support them? Great, thank you so much. So yeah, I'm out in the field, just in the middle of a vaccine clinic. We're actually heading to the Moss Park over those prevention sites from here. So that's fantastic. Uh, but with the COVID uh, extender, the resource team, some of the early challenges were recognizing that when you end up requiring isolation or quarantine from individuals, that we very quickly end up dismantling the social structures that end up supporting people in their communities. And that in order to end up getting resources to individuals to appropriately self-isolate, such as medications and food resources, as well as financial assistance, those resources need to be in place at the time of diagnosis, not a week or so later. They also has to be, have to be culturally relevant and they have to be uh, language appropriate for individuals. So very early on, we ended up uh, partnering with some people in the community. The infectious disease team at Michael Guerin Hospital recognized that they needed help to be able to offer We'll just give a second to see if Bernadette comes back. But no, I think. Yeah. Well, maybe what we'll do is we'll go on to the next question and then come back to Bernadette when she's okay. fine. Okay. So the next question is for Oliva Mabarang, who is an RN and a VHA program manager at Atrium Q Beach Unit. Oliva, we recognize that Atrium at Q Beach was key in helping with capacity at Michael Guerin Hospital. Can you speak to the outcomes that have been achieved with clients in this unit? Okay, am I back? Can you hear me again? Yes, <laughs> oh, the beauty of being in the community. I apologize. Okay, uh, so yeah, I'll wrap it up really quick. The partnerships have really been the essential part in being able to do this. Yeah, are we good? <laughs> um, uh, and uh, making sure that our public health responses are upstream instead of downstream. We can't wait until people are diagnosed. The Thorncliffe organization did a phenomenal job in being able to listen to the fact that we needed these resources in place for people at the time of diagnosis. And we're actually in the lineups when people were getting tested for COVID, connecting people to financial and food resources from that, from that standpoint. So those were some of the early uh, difficulties that we had and some of the ways that we were able to manage them. Thanks so much. Yeah, thank you for, for your time. You're doing the most important work. Oliva. Um, if you can tell us about the outcomes that have been achieved with clients at the Atrium Q Beach unit. Okay, so with our, um, so as I've said, we have, uh, we have a team, we are a team of uh, pediatric nurses when we started at, uh, at the MGH Q Beach uh, initiative, uh, working collaboratively with, uh, with the Michael Garan Hospital um, team of nurses and doctors, we were able to um, support uh, this ongoing initiative. And because our patients uh, have been deconditioned during their stay in the hospital, our main goal is to really reactivate them and improve their functional uh, mobility. And what that means is that when a client is only able to sit in the bed, we try to work out with them together with our physiotherapist, our physiotherapist assistant, uh, and enable them to um, um, work, uh, work with them and ensuring that uh, with little steps, they will be able to walk again. And if our clients are uh, truly bed bound, what we can do for them is to give them um, the comfort, 
right? We we make sure that they are kept clean, uh, comfortable, and avoiding uh, pressure injury. And that uh, is already an achievement on our end. Having the presence of our of the physiotherapists, the physiotherapist assistants, the uh, uh, PSWs, the personal uh, support workers, our foot care nurses, our uh, occupational therapists, dietitians, uh, speech language uh, pathologists. I have to mention everybody uh, because they are a great uh, source resource for us and for our team, and they make a great uh, difference. Um, and impacting the improvement of the clinical outcomes and the quality of life of each of the clients at QBH. So witnessing all these small and big improvements of our patients are very rewarding, uh, especially to our team. And we know that working together, we can always uh, come up with uh, great outcomes. And uh, as I've said, it's been more than a year, which we thought would be a short-term uh, go, uh, short-term help. And our team have really learned to love working with our senior population. And we, uh, we hope that we continue uh, to work with them until our help is needed. Thank you. Thank you, Oliver. It's been a tremendous partnership and much needed. Thank you. The next question is for Rosie Yoon, who is a nurse practitioner at Michael Guerin Hospital Withdrawal Management Site. Rosie, we know that the opioid crisis is one of Ontario's most deadly public health crises. Can you describe how COVID-19 has exacerbated this crisis and what needs to be done to better support clients with substance use? Thank you, Mickey. Um, before I start, I want to make space to acknowledge it's been very difficult and acknowledge the grief and loss in our communities, our families. Um, I, as you know from the briefing note, um, opioid-related uh, deaths increased by 38% three months into the pandemic. And, um, and just to highlight, just last week, in five days, Toronto Paramedic Services reports 13 deaths related to suspected opioid poisoning. And I deliberately use the word poisoning because there is a contaminated supply that is killing people. And I want to bring our attention to what has helped us through this is our community partners rising to the challenge. And specifically, I want to acknowledge and I take pride and gratitude in the work that Moss uh, Park uh, Consumption Treatment Services, South Riverdale Health Services with their Safe Supply, Harm Reduction Programs, Keep Six. These services have ro risen to the challenge in a call, in a timely manner, boots to the ground in the community saving lives. But I have to say that the addiction system across the province of Ontario was severely underfunded, neglected and broken even well before the pandemic. And the pandemic has just highlighted the cracks. Going forward, we need to involve the people who use drugs and their families to the solutions. I'm a nurse practitioner and I work in our withdrawal management facility. Before the pandemic, our bed capacity was 20 people. We have five detoxes. This is what withdrawal management essentially is across the city. And our bed capacity after the pandemic due to physical distancing has been reduced by 50%. That means we can only admit at most 10 people at a time at each location. That's 50 beds for all of Toronto. And furthermore, I want to say gender inequity there are only 10 beds for women. This is for the whole of Toronto during a pandemic um, where people need somewhere safe to withdraw. Yesterday, I, have a, I saw a gentleman at our detox. He had had three overdoses um, in the last month, nine admission to emergency departments, and his life was saved by programs like the Safe Supply and Moss Park Consumption Treatment Service, but that's not enough. And going forward, uh, the province of Ontario needs to really prioritize people with substance use and their families. Uh, and just in the last note, uh, this gentleman that I have here at Detox, he will be discharged in five days and I have nowhere to send him. The, he, he, I cannot, he's homeless. Um, his substance use is severe, there's trauma. 
And the application I faxed for him to go to a residential treatment program is 13 months away. And I don't know where he will go. Uh, the safe beds in Toronto are at full capacity and the province is failing the most vulnerable. And so um, I really hope that going forward, we really highlight the needs of people with substance use and people with substance use are people in our community. They're our brothers, our sisters, our neighbors, um, children, and um, I can't uh, emphasize that more. I, uh, sorry, Rosa, Rosanra, you can count on Arene on that. We are actually pushing for safe supplies. We are pushing for decriminalization. So please connect with us, connect with Matt uh, or Irmajin. Irmajin, if you can put, I don't know if Matt is there, put the link, put the email, connect with us because we can work together to continue to push together. It needs to happen. Absolutely. And it's poorly funded. I just want to know the funding is uh, grossly underfunded. We're talking about not for profit agencies, community agencies on shoestring budgets doing the best yeah. they can. And yeah. it's quite, it's, it's, it's not right. It's not right. And it can be different. Yes, it must be different. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. And as uh, we're, I think we're getting short on time, I'm going to open the floor to questions from our honored guests. I will let Andrea first because I know Andrea needs to leave at four. So let's let Andrea first and then, um, then we can move on to others. You are on mute, Andrea. Uh, thanks very much. Uh, and thank you for, you know, the just the bringing us into the uh, the realities that you're facing each and every uh, day as you try to help uh, Ontarians, as you try to help people in East Toronto to you know deal with not only the ravages of COVID but all of the other uh, systemic issues that we know uh, need to be solved and for far too long have not been solved. And whether uh, whether that's the issue around lack of funding for um, for organizations and, and uh, uh, groups that are trying to help uh, folks who have uh, substance abuse uh, concerns or issues or, or whether it's, you know, seniors who uh, aren't able to uh, have the basic necessities of, uh, of, of living. I mean, this is something that um, RNAO has talked to me about. Uh, folks might know I've been the leader of the party, the NDP party for some time now. And so uh, the the issue of upstream investments and the issue of making sure uh, that, uh, you know, it comes to, when I think about what Rosanna, uh, Ros Rosanna was saying um, about the emergency, this, just this one example, the emergency visits. I mean, if we were investing that money uh, in, uh, in not only the addiction services, but then uh, dealing with the trauma that people, you know, have. And, uh, and so there's just so much to, um, uh, to acknowledge in terms of what's been lacking. Uh, I, I would say that um, we've been really, we've been really fortunate to, in terms of, uh, and I mean, you know, my party, particularly in my caucus, uh, has been very fortunate in, in terms of the relationship that not only we've had with our NAO, uh, but uh, we have some MPPs that are also very uh, engaged uh, in not only in local community, but in systemic change. And, uh, you know, wh whether it's, you know, whether it's living wages, whether it's sick days, whether it's, uh, uh, you know, making sure that we have the services uh, to support people and uh, and provide them with, um, you know, with a quality of life that we can be proud of instead of embarrassed of. Uh, I think that these are all big, big pieces, but I, I don't disagree. I have to say with what Doris uh, was was uh, articulating uh, in her remarks, uh, it's been a it's been a long time coming uh, that uh, these changes have needed to be made. These investments have needed to be made uh, and and. You know, we just can't continue on this way. Uh, it is uh, it is not a humane way uh, for us to operate, and it and it certainly leaves the picking up of the pieces to to folks like you. So I don't have a particular question uh, because you know, unfortunately, um, much of much of what's been said is is something that 
I'm not unaware of. And I know that Peter Tabbins is not unaware of. And I know that Rima Burns McGowan is not unaware of. I want to also say that I, I so much appreciate uh, and I know I said this at the beginning, but in the context of the uh, of the uh, the sharing that's been done, uh, so much appreciate what not only you as individuals bring each and every day, uh, you know, compassionately and in such a committed way, uh, and and you know you do that work while also thinking about and identifying how and where things need to change uh, to be able to uh, uh, to do better by by Ontarians and, and by you. Uh, as uh, as nursing professionals, so I, I do have to. I, I'm getting a little signal on my phone. I do have to attend another meeting, a local one here in Hamilton. Uh, but I, I I want to just leave you with this: everything that you've identified uh, are things that we've not only you know talked about and committed to as New Democrats, but certainly uh, you know it, it's not good enough to have to be yelling and knocking on the door in opposition and saying. These things need to be dealt with. I've been doing that for my whole life, frankly, uh, and would love to be in a position to start making change happen. And so we're we're just going to keep trying uh, to do that. There is a you know there is an opportunity next year to try try to start turning things around. Uh, and uh, and you have our commitment that our values won't change uh, once we uh, once we form government. Our values are not going to change. We spent a lot of time uh, you know waiting for these kinds of uh, systemic uh, issues to be. Uh, addressed um we want to actually make it happen so i'm, I'm going to leave you with peter so Andrea, and with Rima. You go, I, I, I gotta go doris i'm you sorry go. but it's... your colleagues will bring I... back to you the remarks uh thank Absolutely. you thank you for joining uh i did say at the beginning and i will repeat it again that um i need to tell you as a very progressive nursing leader I am heartbroken about all parties. I was heartbroken when in BC, BC, okay? Uh, people needed to fight for the three days sick time. I was heartbroken. I thought BC will jump and say, we give 10. Uh, I, I do need to tell you that I do not think that politicians of all stripes in any country, perhaps with the exception of um, of uh, Australia, maybe parts of Australia, uh, New Zealand, maybe she understood better. I don't think they know what's coming up to them. I really don't think so. And I told Matt in the morning, or if he was in the staff meeting, get ready because we are going to be part of that revolution. And I mean it, I mean it. It cannot continue to be the way it is. I, I think, uh, we have said at Arenio many times that the first wave and the second wave were about ageism. The third wave is absolutely about racism. And those individuals that are now in the beds of ICUs that hopefully many will come out of ICUs live, alive, if not their families, will stand up in arms in the streets of this province to demand different and we will be with them because it cannot continue this way it simply cannot i don't care which party will be in power and when but it cannot continue this way it's just it's not just about not humane it can be different that's the thing it can be different and there is no reason why it cannot be different, whether it's in Israel, Palestine, whether it's in here. I think, I think people will not continue to put up with this as you're seeing in the Middle East and people should not continue to put up with it. It's time for change guys, so get ready for it. And so Peter to you and to Andrea uh, and to my own MPP here in, in our area, and I know Marian lives here and Matt lives here and I live here. Many of us live here, get ready for it. Because, and Jason lives here because we will all demand different. We will demand different. It needs to be different regardless of which party we put the press release today with the party that likely will not even look at it. It got to be different. It cannot continue to be this way. It's just not okay. And it's certainly not okay in a country as rich, in a province as rich as ours, but in any country. It's just, it's just no reason for it. You know, it's no reason for it. Um, I know that, Peter, you may have questions. And um, 
my own NPP may have questions. I think, I think she's here or not. Yes, Rina is here. Rina yeah. is here. She's, I, I she's here. She's here. I don't see Rina. Do hi. I'm here. I'm trying to look. Oh, I Can see you in the car. Or I'm driving. <laughs> okay, be careful, please. There are, there, I as promise. I say to my kids, there is no space at Michael Garron, so be careful. <laughs> I'll be very no careful. I see you. I do have a question, though. Yes. Um, I just came. The reason I'm in the car is because I've just come from a funeral at the Muslim cemetery in um, Richmond Hill for an older Somali woman who died of COVID in a hospital in the West End. And so before I ask the question, I, I do wanna shout out Michael Guerin and East Toronto Health Partners. They have been incredible. And even though the hotspots in Beaches East York have not been on the provincial list, the hospital and the health partners have gone out and they've delivered the vaccines and, and they did the testing and they've just, they've just been stellar. But this is the thing, the, the, the woman who is a, a mom of a very close friend of mine who passed, um, didn't speak, doesn't speak English, didn't speak English, had never, she was in her late seventies, had eight children, had been through a civil war, had never once been in a hospital. So when she was admitted to this hospital, which I will leave, whose name I will leave off for the moment, um, she was terrified, absolutely terrified. Um, and one of the daughters wanted to remain with her because her mother was so terrified. And of course, that's not according to protocol. It's a long story and eventually, of course, they, they made sure the daughter couldn't stay even though the daughter's a nurse. She was in the ICU, but the, the saving grace, the saving grace for her was that her night nurse was a Somali nurse. And I cannot tell you the, the gratitude that the family has. To this moment, they have deep questions about the care that their mom got, which they'll leave for uh, another day. But the care that they got from the, the nurses, and in particular, the Somali nurse who was able to provide them with culturally appropriate care was just, it's, there are no words for what it meant for them. So my deep, deep, deep thank you. And that's why I've told this story. But here's the question. At some point, they were talking about transferring their mom, the mom. And because she was stable and they needed the room, and one of the questions came up, well, where will you transfer her? And will you transfer her to a hospital where there will be uh, a Somali nurse? Because both the language barrier and also the cultural and religious aspects were so important. So I guess that's my question. We know how crucial that is. And you've been talking about that to somebody's healing. To what extent can that be worked into the, when this equity lens, when there's a need for transfers uh, of patients. Thank you <laughs> for, for it's listening. Perspective for a minute from a system perspective and the way things are now in Ontario, in, in, in our so-called province of Ontario and then leave it if it's any difference in, in, in our neighborhood here. Uh, you are aware that the government in its um, desire to ensure that no one will see that people are not treated. They open and open and open and open and open more beds. And not only they open and open and open more beds, uh, they also transfer 1,500 ALC, alternative level of care patients from hospitals to, uh, from, uh, hospitals to long-term care. In that directive to transfer, it says, and is by law now, um, you do not need to respect the choice. You know, people put first, second choice. Even that was taken away, Rima, with the desire to make what I call the Italy ICUs versus what happened in Italy that people were not even allowed to ICUs. It has been the, the devastation 
in long-term care and the, 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 the taking the choice away as it continues to happen. So I do not expect that in a hospital, unless it's a neighborhood that attentively pays attention to that, that in a hospital where everybody is bombarded with admit, admit, admit more, and there are no beds. And you see the number of people that are dying, by the way, in Ontario. The number of people that are dying is not only of COVID. It's the issue of how the care is provided. There is no question in my view as a nurse leader on that. And not because the nurses or the doctors or whoever don't want to do good care, they simply can't with the situation the way we put it, right? And, and we didn't stop the in, influx of people with COVID because we didn't want to give the sick time, et cetera, et cetera. We don't need to go over that. This, this specific OHT knows exactly why we are in the third wave the way we are. So I don't know if in, 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 in our neighborhood things are being um, personalized in a more a uh, humane way. If you are, I tip my hat. I don't know how you do that uh, because I know that my colleagues in the front lines are doing the utmost, the utmost, Rina, to treat people with the knowledge and respect and compassion uh, and courage and courage that it requires. And even the ones that are outstanding are at the breaking point. And I think, Catherine, that's where you started. They are exhausted, exhausted beyond belief. So I will leave it to the colleagues at Michael Garron if you are able to do anything different. But by and large, uh, the exception is the rule. In general, I don't know how they can, Rima. Hi, Rima. Uh my name is Michelle. I'm one of the managers uh, from Michael Garron Hospital working offsite with all of them, the DHA team. Um, I thank you for sharing. I, we work in a very diverse uh, neighborhood. Um, I, our patients are so diverse, so many languages. Um, I think it's, it, it is challenging uh, what Doris said to try and meet all these needs. But I do think that um, when there's funding for things such as iPads, um, really strong connectivity with you know, the internet <laughs> um, and other assistive devices where we can connect family members who may not necessarily be able to come in for visits in the hospital. Um, and if we can have more of those um, devices and staff um, to be able to provide that connection for the families and the patients, um, I think it's important that uh, hospitals be able to provide that if we had more funding for things like that and of course staff right we need people to be able to operate ipads and zooms and facetime right um that we would probably be able to communicate and uh, reassure those families uh, more often uh, i'm not sure what happened with your friend and and the loved one um, but I know that even within our hospital and at, at the offsite, it is very challenging, but uh, the, our hospital really strives to keep the patient's um, care at the forefront and also reassuring the family. So we do really try hard to ensure the families are um, engaged um, and that they're, they're connected with their loved ones daily. Um, but I do recognize that it is challenging technology and having enough staff to do that. Thank you, Michelle. Dora. I'm being called. I am being called. Sorry, um, I'm so so um, and thrilled in listening to you and and uh, and just proud of your work. I forgot the premier is waiting on another uh, on another one of these visits. I will need to excuse myself to deliver exactly what I delivered to you to him. I'm not sure he will listen as attentively as you. I hope. I hope yes. Uh, but I will leave my colleagues, Matt and Marianne, and, uh, and we need to continue the conversation. I know we will. Thank you, Doris. Thank you. Thank you. Rima, I'm sorry for your loss of your friend. Thank you. Thank, Thank you so much. Yeah, it's really heartbreaking. Thank you. I know you, you are all exposed to this heartbreak every day. So I, my hearts go out to all of you and thank you for everything you're doing. Our, our nurses carry those stories home with them. 
you know, each night, all of our leaders as well. And uh, I know our nurses are in, in, in the hospital and in the community are, are doing their absolute best to provide culturally, culturally sensitive care and have families at the bedside even when they can't be there in person. And thank you for your comments, Michelle, as well. So I'd like to invite Rima and Peter to um, add any additional comments, remarks before we close. If there's anything else you'd like to add. I think Peter had to leave, um, Mickey, and uh, I'm not sure if Rima almost looks like she's, oh, there she is. I'm still here, sorry. I just didn't wanna, if Peter wanted to talk, I can't really tell what's going on because I'm not looking at the screen because I'm trying to stay out of the hospital. So that's good. Oh, okay, we better. <laughs> right. So you'll just have to tell me. <laughs> but I just, again, I just wanna thank you so much. You're doing incredible work. I hope that um, you're all finding ways to take care of yourselves. Um, and, uh, and that when this is over, uh, which hopefully will be soon, you, you can all, uh, you know, rest up. And, and uh, I just can't imagine the, the trauma that you're going to have to sort of unpack. Um, and I can't thank you enough. I really can't. It's, uh, I have no concerns whatsoever about the care that our patients in Beaches East York and the East End of Toronto are getting my concern is more about when people get transferred, if somebody goes to Peterborough um, and there isn't that culturally appropriate care, it's not the same with, uh, with just an iPad. But anyway, I, you know, I know you're doing everything you can and I just want to thank you again. Thank you, Rima. I think I'm going to jump. Should I jump in, Irma Jean? I'm looking at you. Yes, yes, go ahead. <laughs> okay. So, you know, I do have a role to formally close us off, and Irma Jean might want to just say something on behalf of Doris to fully close us off. Um, but really, it's been a, a pleasure to be part of this event today. I love how it has unfolded organically with lots of commentary and stories and contributions from all of you. It's great to come together to celebrate nurses, even though we're virtual. Um, the important contributions that they make to our partnership so that we can provide great care to the people of East Toronto. So my role is to say on behalf of the East Toronto Health Partners, I'd like to thank Andrea, uh, even though she was had to drop off. Rima, glad you're still there. And Peter had to drop off as well. But for joining us today, we really appreciate your time and the opportunity to highlight some of our, our work with uh, within the partnership. And a special thanks to Doris and the RNAO, you're doing so much to support nurses during these challenging times. We thank you so much for your efforts. So Irma Jean, I'm gonna pass it over to you to, to take us away. Okay, and I'm going to pass it over to um, Matt Kelway as the Director of Policy. Oh, well, uh, thank you, Rima. Um, yeah, great pr privilege to, to close off uh, today's meeting on behalf of Doris. Um, it also a privilege to do so as, as a member of the community here in uh, the east end of uh, Toronto, not far from uh, Michael Guerin, um, where um, I have uh, had health care provided to me and both my wife and son have been in with broken arms at various times and um, <laughs> uh, much respect um, to, to all of you um, in the East Toronto Health Partners uh, Group, uh, OHT, for all the work you do. Um, every time I listen to uh, nurses in particular talk about their experiences through, through the pandemic, um, I'm blown away um, uh, with gratitude and respect um, for your resilience, your ability, ability to go day after day uh, carrying the weight of the grief um, that you see and experience on a daily basis. As Mickey said, I... I uh, I can understand how these stories go home uh, to families. Um, and I know that uh, from our own survey that, that families don't always um, want to have the stories come home to them and nurses don't want to necessarily take these um, stories home. And so I'm, I'm sure a lot of that grief is internalized and, and just carried um, by nurses, and um, I thank them uh, on behalf of RNAO so much uh, for for doing that. 
And I thank you all for this wonderful presentation today for your heartfelt, honest, um, and, and genuine um, reflections on the work that you've been doing and your hope uh, for the health system and the kind of care that you'd like to provide uh, to the people that you serve so well. And Arneo will do its best uh, to, to carry uh, your hopes forward and, and turn it into a reality. Um, for those of you online today and participated who wanted to reach out and tell us how um, RNAO can help, um, I've left my own um, name and, and contact information in the chat. Please, please reach out to us. And um, yeah, to all of you, thank you so much for everything that you do day after day and for today's uh, event. Thank you and goodbye all. Thank you, a wonderful event. Have a nice weekend. Thanks, everyone. And happy nursing week. Thank you. Thank happy you. nursing week. Bye-bye. Bye. Thank you so much. Happy nursing week.